Hello, everyone. Just to let you all know that this session will be recorded. So if there's any issues or if you feel uncomfortable or any inconveniences at all, feel free to leave the session when you need to. So hi, everyone. I'm your host, Ethan. Welcome to Odyssey Panel 10. Uh, new distribution strategies for Chinese films in the UK. I'm a member of this year's Future Talent Program at UK China Film Collab and an ambassador for Odyssey, a Chinese uh, cinema season. My current research focuses on the impact of Chinese films abroad through states of international collaboration, co-production and overseas distribution. The visibility of Chinese language films is rather limited in the UK since they rarely appear other than at film festivals, art house cinemas or pirated sites. So therefore, the fidelity of foreign film distribution has complicated our understanding of international film culture, distribution and exhibition of modern Chinese films across the UK. Innovative methods might be the key to success as it determines who get to watch what films, under what circumstances and where. So therefore, through this panel, I want to have an open debate with all the industry specialists from distributors to academics in the UK, specializing in Chinese cinema and international distribution. So I'd like to welcome everyone to the panel and I would like to introduce our uh, panel specialists today. So we have here uh, Dr. Xiao Chun Zhang, who is a senior lecturer in translation studies at University of Bristol. Her research interest lies in translation and distribution of films with a special focus in inclusive and accessible cinema. Welcome. We also have Cedric, who is the co-founder and managing director of Trinity Cine Asia, an all rights film distributor, which had released some of the biggest prominent Chinese films in the UK and Ireland cinemas recently, including Youth, Nerja, the biggest um, Chinese animation so far, The 800 and The Battle at Lake Changjing, which is the highest grossing film in China to date, and also films from up and coming filmmakers, such as uh, Bai Xue's acclaimed The Crossing. Welcome. We also have Charlotte, who is the content operations manager and film festival representative at Cathy Play, an emerging platform aiming to promote Chinese independence, films and culture through discovering more Chinese themes with social commentaries and different statistics. She also works as an independent short film producer, practicing on how to spread Chinese indie films and art house cinema worldwide. Welcome, Charlotte. And lastly, we have Dr. Kiki uh, Tian Chi Yu, who is a senior lecturer in film at Queen Mary University of London. She has research on philosophies in non-Western cultures and approaches in other disciplines, enhancing our understanding of global cinema. Some of her works include documentary image and non-fiction films in China, where it was screened in numerous international film festivals around the world. The other area of her specialism lies in cinema and moving image in China and East Asia on women's cinema, image writing practice, and independent cinema culture. Welcome. So really lovely to see everyone. And from our panel today, hopefully we're gonna have lots of fun uh, discussing different points about Chinese film distribution in the UK. So to start this panel off, I hope to present a little presentation on my research in terms of uh, current Chinese film landscape distribution in the UK. If anyone has any questions, feel free also to put um, your comments in the chat box. If there's any issues you found or anything you don't understand, feel free to ask everyone as well in the chat box. Okay, so I'm gonna start on. So the culture of Chinese film distribution in the UK. I think it's quite, it's quite a broad subject and there's a lot of to things to say about Chinese cinema viewership in the UK, but um, how it got widespread was during the Kung Fu era. I think that was really popular around the 70s or around the world because of Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee. And that's how initially Hong Kong Taiwanese cinema entered the UK, but it got mostly more aware and the audiences got a glimpse of big budget Chinese films and epics through the early 2000s due to the success of Crouching Tiger, and Hidden Dragon and Hero. I think in terms of distribution, it's quite hard to say because 
there are a lot of Chinese films that might be successful um, domestically, but it's a lot harder to say when it comes to releasing abroad in Europe or especially in the UK. So up to this point, it's still quite a struggle where lots of successful Chinese cinema releases have been older films with the wuxia genre like Crouching Tiger and Hidden Dragon, House of Flying Daggers, etc. with similar genres as the Chinese audience. Um, they might want to see lots of different types of films, but in the UK, it's still uh, quite rarely seen and it's very hard to be able to see specific or different types of genres. So traditionally, the reason why Crouching Tiger and Hidden Dragon or uh, many mainstream um, Hollywood or co-production or Chinese films got successful is because they've got multinational corporations backing them through, for example, Sony or China Film Group Corporation, and they also have a huge mainstream well-known director, someone like Ann Lee, for example, who has directed lots of Hollywood films like Brokeback Mountain. And then there's the local distributors or uh, international distributors like Sony, who's got a lot of power being able to distribute in the UK through different companies and through their own, for example. And a lot of times they had huge marketing budgets as well, such as this one, which had 7 million um, marketing budget. So the issues I find with in mainstream or art house releases is that um, many audiences or local audiences, they're not really interested in Chinese blockbusters and they have very distinctive tastes or definition of what Chinese cinema should be, such as wuxia or kung fu, where they still have traditional mindsets or even some of the ones they've seen at older film festivals, they can see the fifth generation of filmmakers. So potentially, it could be something like audience prejudice, but I don't necessarily see it that way. It's because they're not as aware of uh, global or foreign cinemas because there's not that many films out there in general. So a lot of mainstream cinemas like Odeon or View, for example, they know what people like to see. They know um, what success actually means. So that's like Hollywood or uh, Marvel cinematic films where it's guaranteed success. They can't really afford risky programming, which is quite a huge shame but that is the case because it represents such a small part of the market and the box office figures so what i wanted to find out was are there new means of chinese film distribution nowadays are there more awareness or more needs and wants for chinese films seen such as uk so netflix for example they've introduced lots of chinese orientated mainstream blockbusters, they've introduced independent films as well. ICE, which is a domestic app, but they've started focusing on more international content, even though some of them might be quite independent, but certainly there are more ways through digital platforms and subscription services. Another thing is that there's more focus, and especially with the European audience, I find that they prefer to see the modern China, they want to see the real China. So a lot of times emerging platforms such as Mubi or Kathy Play, they started screening independent documentaries and um, films ten, uh, from kind of main independent filmmakers and directors and producers started streaming their contents as well, trying to create a bigger presence for uh, more of the aesthetic Chinese cinema. Other cases like Cine Asia, which I think Cedric have a lot of experience on, is direct to DVD distribution by working with uh, local shops, also uh, mainstream um, um, stores like HMV or online like Amazon, um, Zavi, for example, you can distribute through key DVD or Blu ray releases as well. I think another method which can generate a lot of presence for Chinese cinema nowadays, as people are more aware because of film festivals, is there's certainly more film reviews and press going around. For example, The Guardian, they regularly um, review lots of new upcoming Chinese films, such as The Battle at Lake Changjing, which was re released recently by Cine Asia, and also Eastern Kicks, which I sometimes do film reviews for them as well about upcoming Chinese releases at different locations around the UK or work on different types of news to try and create a bigger presence for Chinese cinema. And lastly, I would say 
something else that has been emerging because of COVID times, and a lot of times maybe people can't travel as much to actually attend, I don't know, Cannes or uh, Berlin or lots of international film festivals or even Udine in Italy where they specialize in East Asian cinema. You might want to watch more films online. So something like Odyssey, a Chinese cinema season, which we host, hosted as one of the biggest uh, upcoming Chinese film festivals in the UK or even in Europe, is we try to introduce a hybrid model where we can do a combination of both offline screenings happening in London and Edinburgh, as well as producing it digitally so everyone can stream it at convenience of their own digital devices. So I think there are lots of emerging models and methods of distribution which we could introduce and talk about. And in fact, to further that, I actually did a little questionnaire recently asking members of the public uh, what they thought about Chinese film distribution or their viewing habits. So I actually created a little survey consisting of 15 small questions, each which they can answer in any way they would like. I just wanna focus a couple of small questions and I wanna show everyone the results of these questions. So for example, I asked them, uh, what matters to you when choosing Chinese films? A lot of them don't focus as much on um, dialogues or soundtrack or special effects. They focus more on what the actors are, whether they're well known or not, and their performances. I also asked them about their key genres. So a lot of times they want to, like I said, more European audiences want to see the most recent China, the most realistic China. So they want to hear local stories. So drama tend to be one of their favorite genres. Um, other than that, there's also animation, action, and comedy. I also ask them how often do they like to watch Chinese films in the UK? Sometimes a lot, sometimes not as much, which is predictable. So what methods? Now that's a really important question, which I hope to actually ask all of the panelists as well. What methods would you recommend to watch Chinese films in the UK? A lot of them have actually said they prefer to watch using Netflix, which I've said earlier how they've introduced international contents, trying to bring a more diverse audience, trying to bring, bring more representation to different types of contents they produce. Also, where would you typically see promotions? So I think film review sites are definitely a popular option now. A lot of people uh, would prefer to see reviews before they go to the cinema or watch it digitally. So over 70% of the people that answered in the survey said they prefer to read reviews before watching the film. So that's why Guardian or Ethan Kicks could be a really good platform to do so. And lastly, I asked them how much would they be willing to pay to see a Chinese film? Clearly, they can't really compete with Hollywood films because it's quite niche and it's quite specialized. It's got certain themes that might not appeal to everyone. But shockingly, a lot of people said they are willing to pay to see it. So although a lot of people said they wouldn't pay more than £10, but £10, I would say, is a typical price for a standard cinema ticket unless you're in London. So it is definitely affordable and people do want to see it. What methods would you encourage um, to watch Chinese films in the UK. I think that's something we could really discuss as well because it could be one of the key challenges in what kind of promotion, what kind of methods on how we can deliver to our target audiences. And I asked them why they thought Chinese films aren't really popular. For example, they said it's overcrowded because there's so many different cinema, uh, cinemas and also too much competition from lots of different genres and um, like Italian, French, uh, a Japanese, Korean type of cinema as well. And a lot of people tend to watch American Hollywood style blockbusters. So they're not really interested in a very niche specialized film. They're also very worried about Chinese films being too um, nationalistic. So um, a lot of Chinese films tend to be patriotic with Chinese themes, sometimes even to the borderline propaganda. They're very worried about whether they're being portraying real themes or not. And a lot of them tend to have um, kind of a niche mindset of still watching Kung Fu or Wuxia films. So there's a lot of issues still relating around Chinese cinema. So therefore, what I want to kind of ask everyone is what you think about the certain challenges that we face as a community trying to bring more Chinese films out there uh, to the broader audience in the UK. So um, 
I think one of the first things that we can talk about is, do you think whether there's any cultural barriers between the British or the local audience or international audiences to the Chinese audience? So when we are producing films and trying to distribute around the UK, could there be any cultural barriers? Want to start? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you for this wonderful presentation. It definitely highlighted all the key issues in the film distribution uh, of Chinese cinema in the UK. So um, talking about challenges um, coming from a translation background, yeah, I definitely see cultural barriers and also linguistic barriers. And that's what we are, have, like translation studies have been addressing these issues. And for me, I think uh, skillful translation and appropriate subtitling or dubbing strategy can definitely help the audience to better understand Chinese cinema. So it's also interesting to see that nearly 18% of the survey respondents consider English subtitling and dubbing matter to them when they choose um, Chinese films. And meanwhile, um, almost like 70% of the participants believe narrative matters. So actually audiovisual texts are um, embedded in film language and translation is essential in conveying uh, key messages and um, across uh, languages and cultures. Um, yeah, for example, in this documentary uh, festival, um, I highly recommend the film uh, Mother Tongue if you haven't seen it. So it, it purposely left some of the dialogues in Mandarin untranslated to kind of enhance the emotion of being powerless and when encountering language and cultural barriers. So it's very artistic to me and uh, it demonstrates my point very well. So again, highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. And, um, and uh, yeah, when it comes to uh, strategy, so it depends on the uh, on the audience. I presume um, in the UK or maybe in other part of the world, there are sort of um, more general um, audience who are not so familiar with the Chinese culture, and they uh, probably need the translation to help them to um, bring the Chinese culture more closely to them in a more understandable way. But there are also audience, maybe they are more niche, they are more interested in Chinese culture, maybe they speak uh, or are learning Chinese. Maybe they would like to have a different type of strategy where they can figure out some of the language barriers themselves. So it's, it's about a balance between the two and, um, and when, yeah, when translating, um, probably we should really consider uh, what kind of market we are targeting. And maybe, yeah, another issue could be accessibility. So uh, I see um, like Netflix, uh, they started to have, um, they started to be uh, more accessible. So it would be useful to make um, Chinese film accessible to audience with diverse abilities. So by, for example, providing audio description and include inclusive subtitles. So I see on Netflix, the Chinese, uh, a lot of the Chinese TV shows started to have audio description, but only in Chinese. And it will be useful to have it in English as well. So then, um, yeah, so, and, and then in China, there are also a lot of initiatives and it's exciting to see more and more Chinese films are made accessible, but there's a lot of work to be done there. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think, yeah, maybe I just open the, uh, the easy conversation. I don't want to um, talk long and long. So I would be interesting to hear what other panel panelists are going to say. Kiki, you had something to say? Um, yes, well, thank you, Aeson, for such an informative presentation. Um, and I, I really agree with uh, Dr. Zhang's point on subtitling and translations as an uh, important part of overcoming some cultural barriers, especially some humors and some very emotional parts. Um, but I also want to emphasize that what we call cultural barriers can also be used productively as cultural attractions. And um, for example, certain humors or um, a, a rom-com um, or any like uh, Chinese blockbusters on in well uh, wars, Chinese well civil wars or um, you know any kind of wars, 
if we can kind of uh, uh, mention this in the production, well, in the promotional materials before the audience release, well, see the films and point out this as part of the uh, kind of attractions for the audience to watch this film, then they will have less expectations on the obstacles they might meet while watching the film, but seeing this as something they can learn from um, while encountering a, a new kind of uh, film. Um, but on the opposite, speak um, on the opposite of taking us uh, attractions, I would also want to suggest maybe Chinese cinemas should break it down into, well, we have already been breaking it down into different um, like sub cinemas. Of course, there are blockbuster films, there are art house films, but there are also indie films that's not been haven't been recognized as art house films yet. And these films doesn't really have budget for translation. Um, and there are also other domestic uh, commercial films of a variety of genres that doesn't really uh, aim for international audiences. And for these kind of films, perhaps some other kind of events here, for example, in the UK, uh, we could target at, for example, the mental health festivals, um, uh, environmental festivals, or um, other events related to gender sexuality. Um, so in a way, we probably can de-emphasize in them as Chinese films, but seeing how the content or how the art of the film can enrich our understanding of culture and of social issues, political issues, or art in general. So that's my point. Thank you. Thank you both. I think I've got a really good question, or in fact, a really important question. This is a question directed at Cedric and Charlotte. Since both of you work in distribution of Chinese films, whether independent or Hollywood kind of mainstream, uh, big broad audience style type of blockbusters, I want to ask is, do you ever face a lot of competition uh, competing, trying to compete with other, for example, Marvel films or um, other films that are coming out of the cinema right now that from all of the big six companies like Universal, Fox, et cetera, do you think there's a specialized niche market directly aimed for uh, Chinese local audiences living in the UK or um, in I would say international audiences or even British nationals live in the UK where they want to see those type of films. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I can answer that. But so before I answer that, let me just uh, contribute to what Kiki and uh, um, uh, Xiao Xiao Chun was saying, which is uh, the cultural buyers. Um, yes, it's a big part of what we have to overcome, of course. Because I think a film that is aimed squarely at you know a Chinese audience at home, which will do a big box office, uh, will have references that an international audience sometimes will struggle to to understand. And I think that's been an issue that we had with uh, films like, uh, uh, for example, uh, we have we we actually didn't release it, but the Monkey King uh, sort of animation, which is you know which is very popular in China is very hard to localize because people are not familiar with the myth, with the background. It's not part of the context here. So uh, Noja, we have the same issue because, you know, even though the, the film did so well in China and here, uh, there, everyone knows, knows the character, which is not the case here. So we did release it theatrically and, and we did quite well, but mostly with the Chinese uh, um, speaking audience, so at least a Sinophile audience. So that's always going to be the, the challenge, right? And uh, it's very difficult to sort of bridge that until Chinese culture makes more of an impact in the UK from, from an early stage. So, you know, more and more kids learning Chinese at school or studying Chinese text. Um, but that's not dependent on us, of course. I would just uh, say one thing about that, that obviously, you know, uh, some people in China, producers in China have been trying to bridge that gap and it's done through co-production or through input of uh, foreign talent into their film creatively. So uh, that's given films like, you know, Wish Dragon, let's say, or Abominable uh, in terms of animation, or uh, Boonie Bears, which is out in cinemas now, 
which is squarely aimed at the international audience as well as the Chinese audience. As you see, typically in China, do not do as well as the you know pure domestic hits, but they have something interesting in them because they do distill elements of Chinese culture that is more understandable for kids, and I think they're they're a great way in. Um, so I think that that's 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 what the Chinese industry has been trying to do, and it's been more or less successful in in doing it. I think it's been successful on the artistic front for me. But not so much yet on the commercial front, and I think that's that's a real sort of thing to crack is how do you make it successful on both fronts. Um, sometimes we have film, you know, film like Wolf Warrior Two is interesting, for example, because of course it's 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 uh, it's a main melody film in China, but it's it's got input from America from the Russo Brothers in the way that it's made, and it really speaks to fan as an action film, uh, 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 and they get it. So I think um, it's, you know, uh, we are going into a di direction when e even if you've got like uh, Chinese films aimed squarely at a domestic audience, with careful input, I think, from uh, foreign talent, you can actually make it more understandable and enjoyable by a uh, big audience. So, so it's, that was my point on the cultural, um, Obstacles. Uh, maybe I should let uh, Charlotte speak, uh, answer your next question first, and then I can come back. Yeah. Can Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. So, so firstly, we're in an independent platform, so we're not. There's no no much contradiction contradiction between our platform and say like Netflix or Marvel. I think the one point is to reach the right audience, and the other thing is. Uh, to use the appropriate uh, method to promote your film. Like, as this, uh, the panelists before said, the cultural barrier, like uh, Lost in Thailand and the Breakup Guru, uh, they didn't get much box office overseas, even though the film was shot in Thailand, because they tried to, because well, the reason they tried to film in Thailand is because they, they want to reach the overseas audience, but the audience can't, get the punchline because when they promote the film, they didn't know what, why it's a lot point there. But on the other side, like uh, the Wandering Earth. So one point why it got uh, much more success in the overseas market is because it's genre. Uh, the scientific film is, get, is much more acceptable than com uh, comedy. So that is kind of the thing. Charlotte, you mentioned very briefly on um, terms of marketing and promotion. Could you and Cedric explain on what current models of promotion are you doing in the UK to try and promote to the wider audience to uh, get them to watch more Chinese oriented films? Whether yeah, I mean, more mainstream. sorry, ju 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 just to come back to Sh Charlotte's point now, I think one, one is, um, you know, in terms of do we compete with other blockbusters and so on? Of course we do. Because we we you know we are fighting for cinema space now. We obviously the size of our audience compared to uh, uh, the audience of uh, Avengers or uh, Eternals is is very small. Uh, uh, but at heart we are at least part of that cinema space. So to to give you an example, a very live example, we're now looking at a film that you know we'd like to release early July very soon, but um, the space is very cramped because, you know, now there are, there's, there's a big studio uh, me mega film uh, every week, pretty much from now, uh, starting this week until mid July. So because we, you know, the, the sort of like the key film going seasons are the same around the world, more or less, okay. It's a bit di deep in China because you've got Ch Chinese New Year and you've got festivals, but you you know summer, uh, Christmas, school holidays, etc. Uh, everyone is buying into that space, so uh, we we do take that into consideration when we release films, even though it's on a we aim at a small uh, at a much smaller audience. Therefore, because you faced a lot of competition and 
I'm sure you have your own way of distribution, can put all these points in consideration. What kind of marketing methods would you really apply to try and appeal to the wider audience or the local British audience trying to get them to see uh, more Hong Kong Chinese films? Uh, I mean, if I answer that, it, it, it really depends what the film is and how, you know, whether, whether how big we think that what, what your audience is. Um, so sometimes, you know, like film, like a film, like the Battle Lake Changing, Char it's of course mainly aimed at the uh, uh, Chinese speaking audience again, or, or cinephiles, but it will also be a curiosity because, you know, it is a, it, it is the world's uh, second grossing film of that year. So there, there are stories around, around the film just based on that. And I think pe pe people are curious about seeing it. So our job here is to sort of, we know that it's gonna be hard to, uh, difficult to, to to compete with whatever blockbuster is on at the time, uh, but we can spread the seeds uh, um, and that's what we do. So we try to get coverage. You were talking about The Guardian before and other press outfits. We, we, we try to get the film seen and reviewed as much as we can. Uh, we do, you know, uh, limited outdoor model cooking as well, just to give the film vi visibility out there and to and to make sure it gets uh, noticed a little bit. So for Battle Lake Changing, we had um, outdoor posters. We also had uh, digital po po posters outdoor outside bus stops in 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 London mainly. So it's still very much uh, what what we call, the, you know, uh, um, a targeted release. But I think the point of that is that even though we know most people will not see this film at the cinema, I'm talking about the wide audience, because it's not just not what they used to do, uh, um, because it's too, it's too niche for them, it's too foreign, it's too weird, it's uh, incidental, it's a curiosity, as I say, but it's not something that they used to you know, spend money on at the cinema. However, they, if they are subject to the marketing and if they're aware of the film, when we release the film on other formats, they will already have been familiarized with the film and they will say, ah, the Battle Lake Chang Changing, that was the highest grossing film last year after Spider-Man. Uh, I've heard about it. Yes, it looks you know, interesting or curious. Uh, I may give it a go if, if, it's, if it appears on my you know, iTunes selection or on my sort of Amazon channels or further down the line if it's on Sky uh, Cinema or ne Netflix. And I think that's where we kind of tend to hit that wider audience. It's not upon release, upon cinema release, but it's la later. Yeah, so, so we are not a cinema release and we are a platform. So actually we will release like 10 to 30 short films, documentaries, animations, or features every month. So basically, uh, some of them have a base audience. That means uh, we need to mention its director or its actor. So they'll, the audience will go towards the film. And the other part is that we'll find a certain direction. For example, we'll say, uh, this is a documentary about uh, 21st Chinese music history. And this is uh, the recent 10 years image of Tibet. And actually the most uh, effective way on our platform is about their film festivals, awards, and uh, critics by those uh, public. And another part that we are doing now is uh, because we will have like three to five uh, films released every week. So we will find an image from that film and we will find a tagline and that is within the film. So it's actually uh, maybe a dialogue and maybe it's something, uh, maybe it's a little bit odd, but uh, that works for both uh, Chinese audience and the worldwide audience because uh, they will notice the tagline and then they will be interested in, in this film and they'll go watch it. But actually the most effective way is about, and you, you just tell the audience, this one got, went, went to which festival and got, got an award and they'll be interested. The next question is targeted at all of you. And I'm really wondering, what, because I think there's a lot of online websites other than Netflix and all the major streaming platforms. But I think would 
film piracy play a factor in kind of dis destroying the Chinese uh, film distribution in the UK or would it affect it in certain aspects? Because I know for a fact not everyone's willing to pay 10, 15 pounds to see it at a film festival or a special screening or even um, on a platform where they subscribe. So do you think, could that play a key issue? Yes. <laughs> Uh, I think we lose a lot to, to the piracy website, absolutely. In fact, one of the key things is to make sure that we can release films in cinemas uh, pretty close to Chinese release, because if we don't, uh, we know that a month or two later, they, they will pop up online uh, on um, pirate web websites and we lose the audience or we lose a, a substantial part of the audience. That's really, uh, that's really a problem for us. And, I, you know, it's not just about the Chinese film industry, it's about everything. That's why, you know, studios release films day and day around the world now. And there's a reason for, for that. And it's precisely that. It's because they uh, want to release on digital platform as soon as they can after the cinema release, because they know the films are going to appear online. And to beat the piracy, they, they, they just want to be as, you know, almost as quick as the pirates are. Um, and that's pretty much something that we have, uh, we encounter here. Um, and I think because, but it might be even worse in our case, in audience, because our audience is not necessarily used to seeing Chinese films in uh, legal and above the board ways. So they have been maybe used or they have a habit of accessing Chinese films through illegal means. Sometimes they don't even know that this is illegal because uh, the sites that they go to are, are portray themselves as legal sites and do a pretty good job of, of, of doing that actually. Um, so I think it's, it's about how, it, there's a huge challenge there about how you uh, lose the habit of going on to pirate sites and try to embrace uh, the conception of uh, Chinese films in a le legal way. Because that of course is the only way that this film will be out in the open and will gain, get, gain traction uh, with, with a wide audience. Um, so yes, that, that's definitely a, a problem that we, um, you know, that we, we are thinking of addressing, but it's, it's, it's a tough one, you know, bar uh, doing your own um, online streaming service, which we're thinking of. Yeah, I think I'd like to comment maybe a little bit on, on the fan translation and the piracy. Usually the two are interconnected. Uh, a lot of fans, they translate uh, film, foreign films into uh, different languages because the films are not available or not available quickly or enough for them to share with other fans. So I would say, yeah, so maybe there are some of these uh, fans uh, translation or uh, fan sharing of video document um, materials. They, um, of course, harm the industry in the, in, in the perspective you uh, just mentioned. But on the other hand, it somehow cultivate uh, a kind of local fan culture on a particular mm -hmm. genre. So I guess as an industry, maybe um, need to think more strategically how to kind of make the use of it. Because piracy is, they won't die. <laughs> and then, as long as there's a market, as long as someone wants to do it or someone wants to, or, or there's a fandom uh, who has this desire or demand for certain types of film, uh, it will exist. But how to kind of incorporate, but on the other hand, make um, sort of coexist, but make an advantage of that I think it could be interesting. Yeah, I totally want to uh, second your point of how piracy actually encourage uh, a wide audience to be interested in Chinese mm -hmm. films or, or other non-Western films. Um, but from business perspective, mm -hmm. it's definitely you know, a, bit more, a challenging issue that, that you know, we can all imagine. Would you say that piracy is better for more of the independent Chinese films rather than mainstream ones? So commercial ones, you, you, there are more strategies against it, but the way to actually promote it maybe is to release um, if people are willing to subtitle more Chinese independent uh, documentaries or films, perhaps it creates a bigger awareness in terms of distribution. Uh, definitely from that perspective, but of course, independent filmmakers doesn't want, you know, they don't want to show their film for free and to be pirated just like that either. Um, that's why 
um, I think uh, Cathy play here played a really, really important role and a very um, positive role by, you know, um, providing this platform for independent filmmakers who would not otherwise find, uh, seek other uh, uh, distributors. Uh, just 10 years ago, you wouldn't imagine there were Trinity here, only distribute Chinese films or a uh, platform like Cassie Play. In North America, you have uh, Degenerate, and their main target is um, Educational Institute. And actually, when um, uh, said Secret just mentioned educational uh, as well, uh, sectors, and I just want to pick that up. And that's, I think that's a very uh, important market here in the UK, um, because on, on one hand, uh, UK universities and institutions uh, do not really have a budget uh, like US universities to portray individual films at uh, a standard level. And uh, while we teach at universities, sometimes we just have to get the DVDs from the directors individually and in, uh, well, filmmakers in this way wouldn't earn much money or we buy DVDs if they're uh, well, uh, well uh, personal use DVDs and screen it um, in the classroom. Um, but there are definitely ways to enter the US, uh, enter the UK institutional um, sectors. Uh, uh, even though we don't buy individual films, we uh, subscribe to platforms uh, like Canopy or we don't do Netflix, but like Canopy, we do a Canopy and on there you see a variety of films include Chinese films and if a platform like Cathy Play that's only focused on Chinese films or a, a certain type of films there's a, a possibility for us to actually subscribe to the whole platform and use that for our you know, uh, for the teaching and research purposes and mm -hmm. for the um, secondary school and uh, primary school um, there's I totally agree, there's a huge market, especially now my own kids are entering the primary schools and you can see certain schools offer Chinese classes or after school clubs and that's, um, and there's a huge, well, demand for knowing Chinese and Chinese cultures through cinema, uh, short films, more specifically, um, but how to really reach that would be a, um, probably a, something to think about for distributors like Trinity. Yeah, I mean, yes, it's a, it's a very good point. Uh, uh, I, mean, I, I mean, as I said, we are thinking about it and how we can make uh, uh, the films available online on, on a sort of like uh, um, common platforms. So that if you want access to our films, you, you don't have to go and try and fish, you know, from uh, on various uh, VOD sites. Although I, I guess Amazon probably has pretty much all our films. But um, I think one of the questions, I mean, I, I was interesting to, interested to look at your questionnaire before in question eight, when 10%, only 10% of respondents say that they've gone pi, pi red site. And I think it's a complete, <laughs> it's much more than, than that. And they're just not being honest with, with the answer there. But uh, because I would say it's probably the same as Netflix, probably 80% uh, go, go access Chinese films online illegally. But uh, um, I think one of the things which we've seen, which is interesting, that uh, domain uh, it's in the US, it's the um, arrival of uh, AVOD, which is, you know, that's another way that studios are looking to be the pirates. It's to make the content essentially available online for, for free, uh, but supported by ads. So in the same way, you know, because a lot of young viewers as well are used to seeing ads now again, although, you know, we, we're, uh, je generation which grew up on ads on tv which we hated and then we got rid of them with svod but now they're coming back but but the, but the gen generation now they used to seeing ads they used to streaming stuff on uh, google the whole time and that's that has had ads so they don't necessarily mind uh watching a film with that because anyway they you know they always multitasking while, while they watch films um, and that, I think, is why Evod has taken up so much in the, in uh, taken on so much in in the US 
um, like a service like uh, Tubi or Pluto has gone to uh, you know 50 million sub subscribers in uh, less than eight months. Uh, and I think that's that's definitely one of the ways to be the pirates because you know if a film is free on both platforms, why would you would you not choose the platform which is which is a legit one, which will have better quality. Uh, um, and on which you can watch more content and not be disrupted by uh, content that you, you that is not suitable for you or not safe or that you don't 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 want to see. So I think it's uh, that that's definitely a game changer. Um, but of course, there is there's still a lag between the films coming out and going on. Avod, but I think as a repository of film where you can access content. Uh, easily and for free, I think this could really change change the game. Uh, I, I, mean, think... I, I don't know if Ka if Kathy plays thinking of doing Avod. Yeah, I think the piracy uh, has the biggest impact on us because uh, first we are platform, secondly uh, we are focusing on independent film. So like everyone knows the my, I, like like I know my friends, they watch independent films, uh, not on the platform. Rather, they will find on um, the Baidu disc or uh, iCloud or something, whatever. And uh, especially uh, as soon as your film gets to a major film festival, like uh, Huang Shuli's film, uh, Will You Look At Me, got, went to Cannes. And then, like, my friend had told me that he got the resources of that film. And when the director got the news, like, he was very sad, actually. And I think that is somehow because, uh, like, in China, in the mainland, a uh, lot of people, they have little copyright awareness, like, especially in the mainland, where they are used to use free resources. and we've contacted some uh, website for, and some we worked well with, and they will just uh, put away that film. But some, they are, I don't know, they are, pretty, they are pretty arrogant, and like you can do nothing with them. Yeah, that is kind of like a problem. Yeah, and for the Kiki part, uh, we are doing the education. We, we have like a students and teachers uh, subscription now, and we're doing the educational part like DVD or the SVOD part just for the universities and college. Yeah, well, um, I know we are, you know, thinking piracy is bad, bad for our business, but, you know, we shouldn't forget that China only legally allows 34 films in yeah. the domestic market, and without piracy, you know, uh, Chinese film culture and film, domestic film culture wouldn't be what it's like today. You know, we would not ever see any films, um, mm -hmm. you know, apart from those ones officially hand in to us. So piracy, I think it's, all, you know, definitely work two ways. And it's just how can we use it productively rather than think of it as only a threat. Like China's Van Gogh Beyond, uh, Billy Billy for ages, and they only get a very short version of us, ours, and we've been contacting for years, and they just ignoring us, not you know, still um, not uh, take the film down. But you know, but but so far because we haven't really officially released the film on big screen yet, so the film is there somehow you know helped us. So you know, because even if we uh, released the film in China officially, there wouldn't be much money anyway, um, you know, so in a way it's kind of like, okay, I don't mind, it's being there, people want to see it, people want to watch it, they can watch it there, and if they want to watch a, a better version, a longer cinematic version, then they can seek other ways, because our distributor, um, Cassie, uh, or Canon Doc, uh, does have a website for them to watch it online, but I don't know whether that website can reach the domestic audience, but it, but there are definitely ways for them to reach uh, illegal, or well, legal ways if they want, you know, uh, they want to recommend to other people or they want to continue watching this director's work. 
But uh, I think you're, you're spot on with issues that in China, if you want to see a vast array of foreign films, or just, you know, you have to be a pirate, you don't have a choice. Uh, but here, of course, it's not the case. You, you have lots of choices here. Yeah, 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 you have too many, almost uh, too, too many. Too many. <laughs> yeah, and whether yeah. your film can get to the right audience, yeah. I think it's quite interesting, Kiki, um, on the aspect you talked about education and how that's a very important aspect of Chinese film distribution. So therefore, I kind of want to ask once again, everyone, on what you think about collaborations. Should there be more local collaborations in the UK from different organizations or film festivals or from even students, let's say, where they can set up their own screening? So could there be more done to bring more Chinese films ourselves rather than relying on all the huge distributors or um, independent filmmakers? Definitely, definitely. You know, we have, uh, if we break it down in the UK, there are different communities um, and different communities might interest in different films. Um, I teach a, a module on contemporary Chinese cinema at Queen Mary. And one of the assignments is to curate a film festival. Um, and last year, student did very well. Uh, one festival, um, was focused on ethnic minority films uh, in China and bring that to the U UK audience because you really you rarely see ethnic minority films here and you don't for majority of audience they don't even know what ethnic minority means in within the Chinese context uh, while the Han is the majority even though Chinese here is the minority so that's bring that's uh, that was a very good project and there were also films. There were also festival focus on the British Chinese directors, um, and that uh, is it's kind of the niche areas they target at, and this also the audiences that might be in you know, uh, the, also the kind of topic the uh, audience here might be interested in. Um, yeah, so I would always say, break down what is Chinese, break down what is your audience. There are you know so many of audiences. In each, each individual is, uh, you know, um, has their own tastes. Um, yeah, so, uh, and if you think too broad, um, you know, the audience or UK audience, I think it will be not very uh, productive. For example, the parents at my kids' playground, they rarely watch Chinese films. They don't have time for a star, so they will probably, if there's Chinese film on Netflix, they will probably uh, come across to that. But otherwise, you know, that's not the kind of audience you would want to target at. It's really about what the right audience is. Cedro, don't you do a lot of collaborations with different organizations and uh, art house cinemas and, or even student societies where you organize co screenings together? Yeah, we, we try. I mean, we're doing things with uh, UCFC, as you know. In fact, we, we, we're we going to do something soon. Um, that's not been announced yet, but that's very exciting. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we we get in touch, or people get in touch with us about uh, pu putting some of our films on. Like, we've done a film festival in Durham recently, which was great. And it's just started by uh, uh, students there out of the record who, who, you know, who are studying Chinese and have seen some of our films and really want to create... Um, a Chinese film f f f festival settings there because they want to share their pa passion and taste with their classmates and, and others and, that, and, that, and that's great. But I think institutionally we haven't seen a lot um, and I guess there's still a little bit of uh, um, um, I don't know if it's ill feeling or suspicion around you know Chinese film on on, on one hand it's, it's it's sort of mixed feeling because on one hand there are you know great Chinese filmmakers from uh, revered in, in the UK like the like like the Zhang Mo's and uh, Chen Kai 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 Gu and Jia Jenkers but there's also a great suspicion of what you know Chinese cinema is and uh, uh, and I think that is refraining some institutions from really engaging with uh, Ch Chinese cinema. Uh, somehow, so if you look at you know all the type of cinemas of foreign films like you know uh, French, I don't know uh, German or even Asian like Korean or J J Japanese, I think they'll be much more engaging 
in, engagement from institutions with these types of uh, cinema and less so with uh, with Chinese film. And I don't want to blame the institutions as such for it. Uh, I also think that um, you know Chinese cultural organization could do more outreach uh, themselves to to promote the the cultural wealth of. Uh, China, but there's definitely a dialogue there that's not really uh, uh, going on. I think part of, part, of, part of you know Chinese Marxism and uh, Odyssey really is to address that. Um, but I think there's a kind of uh, let's say an institutional restraint in the UK to uh, engage more with Chinese cinema, and that's a shame. Kiki, so, Shall, do yeah. you have anything to say? And also Charlotte? Yeah, so I feel like, uh, firstly, the film festival are really important because at one point they can bring new films to the audience, but also at the same, same point, they can bring old films, like classical, like an era of something. And like this year, uh, I created seven short films and documentaries from uh, Xinjiang and Tibet. And they, they conclude a uh, middle school young teenager and old herders and the new married woman in Xinjiang. And we've already shown these uh, short films on a Singapore Chinese Film Festival. And uh, I think it's Munich Chinese Film Festival. And we are trying to uh, promote this uh, series, and not series, like uh, a package to Chinese, for foreign Chinese film festivals and uh, foreign like Asian film festivals. And on the other hand, the distribution company and also very important because for uh, maybe in recent years, the two major Chinese companies that, that they focus on distribution are uh, China, Line, China Line and CMC production. And they have their teams in like North America British, uh, Britain and Australia. And they will have, they will focus, they, they will target on their local audience to do the promotion and marketing. But a part of that, uh, most Chinese film, Chinese companies, they don't have a uh, market on the distribution. So like Sin Asia is a really good uh, company that will help those Chinese movies to go abroad. Yeah. I don't have, particular questions, but I think they're really good questions here from the audience. Yes, Martha asked a question. Sorry, um, I have to go in two minutes to have another meeting. Yes, yes. so um, I don't think we have too long, but we can quickly try and answer this question. So Martha asked how The Guardian has covered some Chinese films. Could any of you comment further on the role of journalism in the distribution of Chinese films? Do Chinese distributors work in direct collaboration with journalists? Yes, I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean by uh, direct collaboration. Um, maybe Martha, you can elaborate on that. Uh, because we, you know, the way we work with distributors work with the press is that you, you essentially work with the editors. So you contact the editors or yourself or through a press agent. And then you, uh, um, you pitch a film or you just send them a press release about you and say, hey, this is get, getting released. Um, and try to uh, get uh, coverage that way. Um, so there are, there are journalists that we work with the whole time because I think journalists anyway want to keep their independence and be open-minded about the film that they see and who they work with. So they, they, they don't want to be too close to the uh, di, 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 distributor or at least they shouldn't. Um, but um, it's, so the press is engaging with us and we're engaging with them. So sometimes, you know, uh, press organizations would see our films coming up to the schedule and actually get in touch with us and ask us, can, can we see it? Uh, and that's sometimes a problem that we, we've had because our, our you know, leads, uh, our um, timing that show are so short, uh, the, the lead time that's so short between when we get the film and when we release it that sometimes there's actually very little time for the journalist to see it before it's released. So we do miss out sometimes on reviews just because of that. Um, but I would say, that unfortunately, a lot of the engagement from the press doesn't often always come from, you know, open-mindedness and 
wanting to uh, uh, review the films for for what they are. There's also, you know, uh, it's a politicized uh, intention occasionally. So they want to, you know, detect what they can see as a as a message that the Chinese government is sending through films or something like that. Uh, so I think there's too much focus on that rather than looking at the films for what they actually are in some part of the press. Not 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 everyone, but I think some of the main, mainstream press tends to uh, focus on, to over-focus on that, in my view. And that's part of the reason why they're interested in Chinese cinema rather than the accomplishment of the film and filmmakers uh, them, them, themselves. Thank you, Cedric. Bev also said, I love this festival and would love to find out more about different types of screenings. I think if you check out Cine Asia on their website, they always post newest information about different Chinese films available. And also you can subscribe to uh, the UK China Film Collab mail list so to find out we always host lots of collaborations and different events for upcoming uh, Chinese film screenings as well. So you can keep up to date with us to find out more. Does anyone have any other questions? If not, we can consider the panel finished. And I. so any other comments? Yeah, I just post our Cathy Play website. If any of you guys are interested in watch more Chinese independent film, just go and watch it. Yes, feel free to go on Cathy Play's website as well. They always have lots of innovative and independent Chinese films worth watching. I always go on there as well. I would love to see some more films available. Thanks. Right. Thank you all for coming to the panel today. It's been a great discussion. I think I've learned a lot and I hope everyone else had a great discussion and uh, had fun communicating, debating with each other on the topic of Chinese film distribution. And I'm looking forward to staying in touch with everyone. Hopefully we can have another panel sometime soon. So uh, thank you all for coming and yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs> Bye.